And a very good evening too. I'm Lisa Lord and my special guest is the Chief Fire Officer of the Barbados Fire Service, Mr. Errol Maynard. Mr. Maynard, thank you so much for joining us on the program. You're welcome. Good evening. And Lisa, welcome to the Barbados Fire Service. Thank you very much for having us. Now, I want to start by looking at the first six months of 2022. Let's review the fires that the service would have responded to between January and June this year. Okay. So far for the year, we have responded to approximately 723 fires. That is compared to 826 last year. So we have a, a decrease in about 12.5%. We try to reduce all fire calls by 10% every year. And thus far for this year, we are ahead of that. Those fires include private dwelling house, or what we call a house fire. And we have a, decre a decrease about two calls. So that's about two calls different. One is 33 and one is 35. We have grass fires. They have increased from 301 last year to 345 for this year. Rubbish fires has decreased from 301 last year to 207 for this year. Thus far for the year, we have only had three commercial fires, and that is down from 10 last year. So we're doing quite well for the year. Although we have some areas that are increasing, we have an overall decrease in fires of 12.5%. Now, following investigations into these fires, what are some of the main causes? Well, some of them are accidental. Some are deliberate, like persons trying to clear um, in the case of the grass fires, some people are trying to clear a lot. They might have issues with rodents and vermin around their property, so they will try to burn it off. Then we have carelessness, and this comes with the house fires. A lot of the house fires, in, on investigation, we recognize that it's carelessness. Some persons might be cooking, and they're tired and they fall asleep and the food will burn. The neighbor might smell something and they will call the fire service, not recognizing that the neighbor is at home. We have also had some where people will leave the stove on, apparently forget that they are cooking and leave and go to work. Then the fire service will get a call from a neighbor that, or if they have an alarm, the alarm will go off and the neighbor will call and say, well, we have a fire at this particular premises or they will see the smoke emitting from the building. If that happens, we will respond, and that we call that generally a fire alarm with good intent, because mm -hmm. the house might not necessarily be damaged, but the, whatever the device that they're using, it would have worked to inform us that there is a potential fire. And then we have the deliberate ones, like they may have some arson or some criminal element performing some, and to hide the crime, sometimes you will get deliberate fires. How prevalent is arson though? Arson, I wouldn't say it is very prevalent in Barbados, but we do have some. The fire service essentially though, is not the one really responsible for the arson investigation. That is in the remit of the Barbados Police Service. What the fire service, we will join with them to help investigate the cause. And then once the cause is established, then they will go on to determine whether or not it is arson or if it's accidental or otherwise. We have sent two officers to England to be trained in arson and for a cause determination. And we have, have an arrangement with the Barbados Police Force to police service, sorry, to have these officers work along with their forensic officers to, and they will get some valuable experience and they will share their knowledge. The police will share their knowledge with us and we will share our knowledge with them. And in that way, it helps to develop our officers because eventually we want to have a, a cadre of officers who can adequately 
and professionally investigate the fire on their own. So uh, we're working with the police to build capacity. Now, when the fire service responds to fires at homes and businesses, in most instances, you're still seeing a situation where these places are not insured. Yes, correct. A lot of the house fires are not insured. We, especially in the poor communities, you'll find that these houses, um, they, will lose, they will lose approximately two, three houses. And when you check, none of them are insured. Um, this places a lot of burden on the individual. It plays a lot of burden on the society and the government as a whole, because we now have to look, to, to, they have to start from scratch and the government might have to assist them in finding shelter or somewhere uh, providing with another house or so. So it is a burden not to have insurance, I mean, not having insurance. And we believe that insurance is critical because starting up or starting over is never easy. So therefore, the insurance is essential. But too many people are investing and placing a lot of money into a home and then not in insuring it. That is a problem. The Commissioner of Police, he recently expressed alarm at the number of vehicular accidents we have recorded already for the year. Now, while the fire service is not called out to every accident because you usually respond to more serious accidents, are you seeing an increase in the number of serious accidents that your officers have to respond to? Yes, Lisa. We, thus far for the year, we have seen an increase of about 40%. 40%. 40% of the, of the motivated accidents that we respond to. And you, can, you know that we only respond to those that are serious or where some person might be trapped. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it takes up a lot of our resources um, to respond to these because we normally will respond to a motivated accident with a minimum of about 11 persons. That two, a rescue tender, a water tender, and each of these would have a minimum of four persons. Then we have a safety officer who will go to make sure safety and he or she will be responsible for the safety of all responders in the, within the scene, not only fire service responders, but whether the police is in the scene, the ambulance service are on the scene, all of, he's responsible for that. And then we have the, the senior officer, the commander who will take charge of the, the rescue or the extrication. So there's a lot of resources expended going to these accidents diesel and manpower. I don't want to stick on accidents for just a minute. Mm -hmm. I think about two of your appliances were in accidents recently because motorists did not adhere to the siren. Yeah, sometimes we have difficulty with road users. They fail to move adequately out of the road when they hear the siren. And we have had that problem, and not only with the fire service, but the police and also the ambulance service has complained about this particular practice. Um, some of them will complain that they did not hear the siren because they might have a loud music in the car and the windows wind up, and they have difficulty hearing. We have a big red truck, siren on, and the lights are burning. And when we, have a vehicle being involved in an accident, especially if it's serious. It means that the help that's supposed to be going to someone cannot get there. We have to send another unit to attend to that. Now we don't have spare vehicles put down that when one is damaged that we could go and say take up another spare vehicle. A fire, a plant costs a minimum of a thousand, a million dollars, and it takes approximately a year to build. So we don't have them put up. So uh, once persons are not moving out of the road, it poses a challenge for us. Uh, how we counteract that is try to educate the public, but also we send our drivers to defensive driving training. Um, so there I try to avoid acting at all costs, but we could appreciate as good as you are and as careful as you may be, there's still the possibility of getting to an accident. That is a serious thing for us, and our vehicles are aging right now, and therefore we can ill afford having these accidents. So 
persons need to be a bit more careful as they use the roads and allow the emergency vehicles to pass freely. We're also seeing a lot more vehicular fires. Do you have stats on that? Yes, Lisa. We have, so far for the year, we would have had 27 vehicular fires. That is down though from last year, in which at the comparative time, we would have had 36 um, vehicular fires. The good thing is that these fires were not problematic at this time. We, we know we have the import of electrical mm -hmm. vehicles. We haven't had any fires in Wooden, including electrical vehicles so far from the year, but we do a lot of research and we know overseas there were some fires in, involving electrical vehicles and this posed a challenge for us. We will continue to do the research and we will continue to do the training and prepare our officers to deal with these fires. Because once a battery gets on fire, that is a major challenge. It's not going to be extinguished easily. Um, some of my colleagues, they have even developed large tanks of water that you can put the, uh, cover the vehicle in, and they the vehicle in water in order to get these electrical vehicles extinguished but they are of concern to us and we're looking into it to see how best we can prepare ourselves and acquire the requisite equipment to deal with these fires. And in your research, have you found out any reason as to why we're seeing this number of vehicular fires? Well, in some cases is poor maintenance. The, there's no, greater risk to the, uh, the electric fires than the gasoline fires. But if the maintenance is not there, then you will have a lot more fires with the um, gasoline fires. Because you know, in gasoline, there's a vapor and once there's a possibility of a heat source, you will have, you will have a fire um, starting from that particular vehicle. And there's nothing to say that in some cases, when you look at the circumstances around the fire, that you are in no doubt that there was human intervention in order to get rid of the particular property that they would have had. Now, let, let's move a little away from fires. The fire service is also involved in rescues, persons, animals from wells, etc. I know the service rescued a man from a seven-foot canal in Spikestone just last week. In terms of stats of rescues, well, so far for the year, we haven't had uh, many rescues. Um, last year, this same time, we had about three. This time now, we have up to yesterday, we probably have about five. But the, the rescue and all rescues are very, very, very slow pace. So it, it involves a lot of resources. So into any rescue, we will send, similar to a motor vehicle accident, we will send two vehicles and the safety officer and the commanding officer to the scene. Then in that, we will have going to that rescue, the ambulance service, the police is always there because of the, we inform all of these um, individuals. So once we get a rescue, we inform the police ambulance. And if it is really, really difficult, we may have to uh, get help manpower ways from the Barris Defense Force. Uh, but the rescues thus far from the year has not been as challenging, challenging as in previous years because so far we haven't had many. And I know that your officers are undergoing more cave rescue training. Yes. We have a lot of, especially just prior to COVID and during COVID, a lot of Barbadians were traversing the galleys. Mm -hmm. They are going into the caves, um, probably trying to find some new form of recreation, some new form of exercise. And uh, I'm also a hiker myself. And I've found that there are a lot of areas that we don't know. We're not familiar with, but people are always there. And it was felt that we need to get the officers familiar with these rugged terrain. So we've embarked on a program. We've utilized persons from the Barriers Hiking Association. And we have laced Mr. Wanza from the Babis Water Authority to take us into the caves and also on some hiking trips.
and we will continue that until we are comfortable that the majority of the officers are comfortable in these rugged terrain and they have some level of familiarity in these areas. The service also conducts fire inspections of businesses. Are you satisfied with the fire safety equipment and the fire exit routes at the businesses? Majority of them at least. Yes. In the majority of them, they have the requisite exits and the fire fighting equipment as needed. Most of them will call for the inspection. We sometimes will leave and we will go and inspect them without they're requesting it because that is basically our mandate to inspect these areas and make sure they're safe. When we find a challenging person or when we find some defects, whether it is, and when we are doing an inspection actually, we don't only inspect for what it is that we do. If we see anything that the labor department is supposed to um, be aware of, we will inform the labor department. If we see anything that the Ministry of Health is supposed to be to deal with or to be informal, we will inform them also. And sometimes we do a collaborative visit or inspection that we will deal with it one time. On the other hand, the majority of the businesses are compliant. We have had occasions where one or two were not, and we will use moral suasion up front to get them to comply. If that does not work, in which there's only a very, very small few. If that does not work, we have to take more stringent measures, even if it comes to closure, to do that. But most people don't want to be closed, and we don't want to close any stores if we can avoid it, because that puts people out of work for a period of time, and that is a social and economic challenge. But as a rule, most persons complain. I want to look specifically at businesses in Bridgetown, Swan Street specifically, because I know that was a challenge for the fire service. Is it still a big problem? Swan Street, Lisa, is still a problem. Some of the stores are compliant, some of the businesses are compliant, but we have had this influx of persons setting up their businesses in their kiosks in front of the exits. And some of them are encroaching the pathway of an emergency vehicle. So if you pass up there today, you will recognize that on both sides, they may have some person setting up their little shop, their little table to sell their produce. If an emergency vehicle has to travel through there for any reason, it's impeded because it will have to travel over your things and we won't want to mash them. If you have to push them away, we will do that if it is necessary to save lives. But these businesses or these operators who fill up Swan Street and park in front or put their, set their things in front of the businesses and the doors and the exits, we, that is a problem for us and it poses a problem for the customers because if anything happens, it places them in danger. And we tr would really appreciate if that can be avoided. I, I hear you on that point, really vendors, but a lot of these establishments also only have one door. Yes, we, we have some one door shops. And while a one door shop is a challenge, all of these stores really cannot and have no way of putting in another exit. In that case, we work with them to put in what we call compensatory measures. That they make sure that all the aisles are clear, they make sure they have early warning systems in the store. And they minimize the amount of people in there at any given time. Because in actual fact, there is a number of, a requisite number of persons that should be in any establishment at any given time. Whether it's a pet, whether it's a supermarket, whether it's a clothing store, there is a, a number that should be there. So once we can get the operators to put in the compensatory factors or the mitigating factors, we can work with them. because. A uh, one door shop is not a novel to Barbados. We are all over the world. But what we don't, what we will not encourage is that any future building have a one door. But those that are there, we will work with those. Earlier, you pointed out that some fires are truly preventable, and the service that has been working with Barbadians through your community program to teach things like fire prevention measures. Could you tell me some more about that? Yes. In addition to our 
online training, which we do for the public, and our fire prevention training, which you might come here to the, the academy to do. We also started a community program just before COVID, and we will be continuing that program um, this year, in which we're going back into the community. We will teach the residents about fire safety and fire prevention, and also how to use the requisite for fighting equipment, like a hose reel, like an extinguisher. We will teach them to do all that. In addition to that, we want to be able to teach these persons how to be resilient as a community. So that if there's an incident or call for help, they can help themselves before the, respond, the first responders get there. And that means that we want to teach them how to use a chainsaw, how to clear a road, how to clear a drain to make sure it doesn't flood, how to rescue themselves if there's a flooded area, or how to avoid going into flooded areas. And everything that is needed for them to be resilient and everything that is needed for them to be able to save themselves or save a neighbor, we will be going into the districts and the communities and training them to do that. Because once we have done that, it means that the loss of life and the quality of life, we will prevent the loss of life and the quality of life after an incident would be much better because these individuals now can respond and help themselves. I don't know, over the years, the fire service used to go into communities and give out smoke alarms. Yes, the smoke alarm program, that was primarily for the elderly mm -hmm. who live alone. And we, we have peter off of that a little bit, but I think that the fire prevention unit, they're thinking about that and they're going, they will start back that. We have some sponsorship. Um, sp um, some of the business houses used to sponsor the smoke alarms that we give. But we, that is not a budgeted item for the fire service, but we will encourage once we get the support from corporate Barbados, we will continue the smoke alarm program and we will continue to install them for them and expand it if necessary. Now, over the years as a journalist, you would go into a community after a fire. Sometimes you would speak to neighbors and you would hear after three, four, five houses, none of these houses have a hose. Is that a concern? A hose? A hose. A garden hose? Yep. I wouldn't say it's a concern. It would be good if you have a hose. While we train persons to use a hose or to use an extinguisher, at the end of the day, if you're not comfortable using it, we advise you to head to safety. So if some person doesn't have a hose at their home, it's not a problem, but if they have a hose at their home, it's good. And if they have it in a position that they can use it, to extinguish a fire, it would be even better. And now we're talking about even homes because some persons don't even keep around their surroundings clean. And sometimes the grass grows right up to the side of the house and when the, there's a grass fire during the summer season. Disaster waiting to happen. Disaster waiting to happen. And the, and, and the grass and the house, the fire will burn straight up to the house. You need to keep at least a 12, 15 feet space around the house clean and low. That means that if a grass fire happens in your area, you have a little bit more comfort because it will come and it will stop. So even in the cleaning around your home, you need to keep that clean if you're going to prevent some of these preventable fires. We're here at the Arch Hall Fire Station, which is also the hub for the Barbados Fire Academy. Tell me about the work of the Fire Academy. The Fire Academy has been doing a wonderful work. The Fire Academy, Fire Academy is responsible for ensuring that they produce not only professional, but personal development programs for all fire officers. And as we speak, we have some recruits in training and we have some professional development program going and together. And, we will, and then we have some online training that some of the officers do um, on a daily basis. The Fire Academy also reach out to corporate Barbados. We do training like 
working at heights for our safety, the training um, we do, this one is slipping me right now, the evacuation training and for businesses. And then we coordinate with other entities to do training. Like we have a program that we'll be starting very soon with BIMAP. We have we work with BCC. Um, we are working with Sedema to do some training with a regional body. So the Fire Academy is doing some fantastic work to keep Barbados safe and to also keep the fire officers up to date in its training. Right, and you mentioned um, the regional entity, Sedema. You don't only train fire officers from Barbados. No. Um, any, we have done courses for officers in St. Lucia, Dominica. In recent time, previous we did a lot of training for persons in uh, the British Virgin Islands, um, but we haven't done much of that in recent times, but we do train uh, regional persons. As a matter of fact, there are a number of officers regionally that are now showing a renewed interest in the programs that we offer. All right, Mr. Maynard, still a lot more to discuss regarding the Barbados Fire Service. Stay with us. You're watching One on One. Keep it clean. Keep it green. Barbadians, we invite you to get involved and play your part as we clean and green Barbados. Come into your community with media launches, bulk waste collection exercises, community engagement sessions, and giveaways. Get on board. Let's keep Barbados clean. And green. Beautiful, beautiful Let me begin preparations. This hurricane season. Let me sit down and reason. Let me secure a nation. Go your shelters, Bajan. Help out one another, get liberation. Develop emergency community plans so that we could function. Remove outdoor objects. Make sure that you went to the ATM. Stack up with water. Make sure you clean the gathering. Lord, what about clean food? Make sure you got some stock up in your room. Make sure you prop up the paling and tie down the roof. Let me start to prepare real soon. Let me begin preparations. It's hurricane season. Let me sit down and reason. Let me secure a nation. Go your shelters, Bajan. Help out one another, get liberation. Develop emergency community plans so that we could function. Welcome back. Mr. Maynard, before the break, we were talking about the training and development of your officers. One of the programs you have in the fire service is the development of emergency medical technicians. Tell me about your EMT program. Okay. Um, we have embarked on a strategic program to train all officers as EMTs. For sure, all of the recruits that come in now, they have to be trained as EMTs and firefighters. Um, as we speak, we have a cadre of 20 being trained as EMTs. And this is to be able to, that we can set our standards as an international fire department. All fire departments, the minimum standard for firefighters is the EMT course or the EMT uh, certification. Um, it also helps us when we respond and we have individuals who are injured or ill that the our EMTs can take care of them until the arrival of the personnel from the emergency ambulance service. In addition to that, very often persons from overseas will see a fire station and they will come and knock at the door if they're not feeling well or some person is injured, they will come and knock at the door expecting help because this is what is the norm internationally in North America, Europe, this is the norm. So what we, are doing once we have the officers trained, we have the kits for them and the equipment, they will respond to calls for help at the request of the ambulance service if they don't have a unit immediately available. What we'll do then is to stabilize these individuals until the ambulance service gets there. We won't transport, we just stabilize them. Whatever is necessary to stabilize them, we will do that until the ambulance service gets there. 
this is where our aim is not to take away from what the ambulance service is doing, but we want to augment what they are doing to uh, provide a better service for the public of Barbados. The ambulance service is basically centralized with the exception of they have a unit at the Arts Royal Fire Station, uh, which covers the north. But we have fire stations all over the country, and therefore, there's an EMT present at every fire station, and therefore, that means that the, in, the public can have that access to early medical care much faster than what they will get from the ambulance service. And even when we develop and we build new fire stations, within the design, we have ambulance built into that. You mentioned that you have 20 recruits now going through EMT training, being trained as EMTs and as fire officers. Is the fire service fully staffed? No. I can say no, the fire service is woefully understaffed. Our establishment is where approximately 250, and currently we have less than 200. And even with the 20 persons that we mentioned earlier, and with retirements and such, that will only put us to just over, uh, just over 200. And uh, even with our full establishment, we don't have much elbow room. So you could appreciate that if we are down below 200, we are really on the staff. The officers do their best, and we do our best to continue to serve Barbados. But we definitely need some more personnel. Because on many occasions, if we have just one station affected by an infection, whether it's the flu or even COVID, and a number of officers have to be out, then we have to ask officers to double up their shift in order to ensure that Barbados is adequately served. So we are on the staff, and we, we are hoping that we can get some more staff to be able to better serve the country. But what are you doing to make the fire service more attractive? Well, one of the things that we have done, we have a number of programs going. Um, the, the EMT program, because they are, they are persons that like the medical arm of it. We have developed a number of areas. I think I mentioned earlier that we are looking at having persons in the uh, fire investigation um, units. We have a inspectorate um, where the officers be trained as inspectors and some officers like that. So there are different areas within the department that we are developing. And once we get those developed and we generally publicize it, once people know that they will, the price will become more attractive because just saying that you're running to uh, a fire to extinguish a fire is not as attractive as it used to be. Um, we also have search and rescue teams. Mm -hmm. um, there's training all sorts of uh, rescue techniques. Um, that in itself is attractive when persons see these persons fleeing from ropes and such like. Um, they are, become attractive to the fire service. And in addition to that, we are establishing a station in the Bridgetown port. That means that we will be going towards the Marines type of firefighting, fighting, firefighting on um, motor vessels. There are persons who love the sea, who love boats. That will be part of the attraction going forward. It also helps to develop the fire service and the officers in the service to make them more rounded and more professional and more prominent within the society. But that is not the only reason we are doing it because we have found that that was one of the areas that we were lacking in providing protection for Barbados. We had very little skill set in that particular area, the marine firefighting area. So uh, even in that area, we've joined arms with the Barbados Coast Guard. And we will be conducting some training, a collaborative training with the Barbados Coast Guard later this month to make sure that our officers have a good understanding on the operations on, 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 on a motor vessel. They might have the basic firefighting skills, but operating a motor vessel is a totally different animal. And therefore, they need to acquire that skills. And we, we have arranged with the Coast Guard to have some training, um, firefighting training on motor vessels. Tell me some more about this fire station in the Bridgetown port, because 
that is in the Bridgetown area. And then the Corbin Street headquarters station was demolished. That was a major concern for residents and business persons in the Bridgetown area. I know that you have the station, the temporary location at Plain Plantation Road, but persons were saying that was not enough. Yes, we have a station being built in the Bridgetown Port. It will be finished most likely by the end of August this year. So sometime quickly after that, it, it will be operational. We'll be opening that station and it will be operational. And that station will serve the Bridgetown Port area and the city, the, the, the city area. Um, that does not mean that if there's something outside of that, what we can find as, or what we demarcate as the city area, that it will not go there to assist. But it will be responsible for the port and the city. Uh, when we moved the, or when the building at Corbin Street was demolished, there was a lot of concern mm -hmm. that the city would be left exposed. So uh, the port station will now be able to take care of the port, which is a high-risk area for us, and the city, which is also a high-risk area. So uh, that station would take care of that, and uh, also it would be housing or hazmat, hazmat unit. So there are currently five stations. You spoke about the fire station now that will soon be open in the Bridgetown Port. And we heard about plans for a new station in Six Roads in St. Philip and Nestfield in St. Lucie. Yes. We, let me speak to the one in Nestfield, St. Lucie first. Sure. We closed a station at Western in St. James because of some other reasons. But we don't have Outside of our shawl fire station, that's the closest to the north. The north, as we can see, is developing. Yes, it might is. not necessarily be developing as fast as the east in St. Philip, but it is developing. And therefore, we need to have some protection down there. We have worked with the relevant government agencies, and a plot of land has been identified to build a station in the north of the island to protect those residents and their property in the north of the island. In St. Philip, we, I'm sure that most Barbadians would have heard that a station was going in Six Roads, St. Philip, for many, 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 many years. A while. A while. Mm -hmm. And some of the property that would have been identified in some of those years uh, are not occupied by other structures. But we have also identified a place in St. Philip for a station. And we have written the the ministry to, that we can start the provisions and the, put the mechanism in place to have the station at Six Rose and at Nestfield in St. Lucie established as soon as is practical. And once we have these two or three new stations coming on board, do you think that you're in a much better position to service the island? We'd be in a much better position, but I don't think that would be the end because Ideally, in any country, if you can, the, 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 the lower or the smaller the response time is better. So once we could, and as you start to develop in this modern times, we will have different risks. And as these risks come about and we develop all the different industries, we might need to establish more stations because the response time to these establishments might need to be shorter. So therefore, we, I can't say that that would be adequate, but we will see as it goes. How was the Barbados Fire Service impacted during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, we were impacted like most other organizations. Um, the good thing for us that we did not have any internal spread of the COVID among officers, but we did have a number of cases. And once we have a case, that whole shift would be quarantined and the, 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 the person who was positive would be isolated. During that period, the way we impacted us so severely is that that whole shift had to be quarantined for initially for the seven days or whatever. Then we would use off-duty personnel to substitute and that shift. And we did that and the, and the officers really were really good in committing to do that because some of them had to work double shifts, 
triple shifts to make sure that we continue to keep all of the fire stations open and to keep all of the uh, vehicles on the road continuously. So we wanted to make sure that Barbados would still serve so uh, the officers would have opted to double up and shift. Now we saw one incident in particular that highlighted a severe lack of personal protective equipment. Has that been resolved? Yes, We've, we, we don't have any issues with the PPEs and we, even the Ministry of Health sometimes help us with um, acquiring PPEs as necessary. You mentioned that in some instances, your officers has to do, had to do double and triple shifts. How do you avoid burnout? Well, that was always a, a challenge. So what we did in some cases, every, the same persons will not necessarily flex, as we call it, every time. It will rotate it as much as possible. But we knew that it was not the forever. And some of the routine things that we will do on a daily basis and accept the checking of equipment and such, like we stop that, we, we actually stop some of the tours that we will have people come into the station for tours and we stop somebody going out and doing some of the routine inspections that we would have done to make sure that the officers don't burn out and that they don't also go and contract the virus and bring back to the station. You mentioned things that you had to stop in terms of tours and programs, but one thing that has restarted is your fire cadet program. Tell me about the fire cadet program. Yes, the fire cadet program. Um, for those who don't know, the fire cadet program was going since 2000. And this program has evolved into what we have now as senior fire cadets. Initially, we started with between 12 to 15 years old and we will pull them from specific schools and specific groupings within the schools. But we have expanded now that we have from 15 to 18 years old, and there are now what we call the senior cadets. And some of these cadets were, are so well trained, and we were able to use them at the request of the Ministry of Health in the COVID Operation and Logistics Center. We also use some of them at the airport to assist during the COVID time, and some at these testing centers to assist where staff was lacking and where they needed um, disciplined persons to work in these areas, we were able to use some of our cadets. Um, as we speak, we have some of the cadets here on site working with the control the dispatch, which is upstairs, and they work with the dispatch to learn how to operate in the dispatch center, so they could even dispatch a fire, take a fire call and dispatch equipment. And some of them are also doing public speaking. So we don't only teach them things about the fire service, but we also teach them life skills. So they're doing public speaking. Um, those who need it, uh, we will give them things like how to do resume, report writing, to augment their skills that they would have got, that, that they would have received at school. And the ones that are 18, you could appreciate that they are just at the threshold of the job market. So things like resume writing and such, like we would have helped them with that. And so far, we have had extremely good reviews from the Ministry of um, Health on the performance of these individuals. So our program has been successful. And I think we have a number of them who have also um, opted to join the fire service and some of them are enlisted. A few weeks ago, you would have been in the news reporting on the number of prank calls that the service has received. Have you seen a reduction since that story came into the media or you still having the same problem? We are, we are still having prank calls. It, there, there's a reduction for over this year, over last year, but we're still having these prank calls. And is of grave concern to us. I don't know why people will take up a phone and some, in other cases when you hear the voice, it's an adult. Why they will take up the phone and they will call the fire service, the ambulance service, uh, as in the case last week, and report an incident just to see a fire truck on the road. When a fire truck or ambulance or even a police vehicle has to leave 
the station, it means that there's a lot of resources being expended. There's the danger of getting into an accident. <clears throat> so you're endangering the lives of the responders and the lives of the public. And then the amount of resources that you expend, because we send, in some cases, two, three vehicles. That is diesel, wear and tear, and the possibility of accident. Then we, if it's out of work time, that officer has to leave his house or his home, we have to compensate him for the travel that he would have done. And then this commits vehicles and resources to one incident that does not exist. When it probably could be better served at another incident somewhere else in the country that is real. Because we, 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 once we cannot confirm that it is a real, we will respond. And we will do all our best to check the entire area. Uh, we have this motto, when in doubt, turn out. But if we can't confirm it, we will turn out. But if it's a prank call, it means that we are expending an extreme amount of resources for nothing. And it's a dangerous practice. You mentioned a comparison between last year and this year. Could, do you have these statistics here in terms of malicious calls? The malicious, last year, the same time, we had 74. This year, we have 47. Um, so there's a, a, a drop, but it's still too many. One prank call, one unnecessary call is too many for us. Now, as chief of the Barbados Fire Service, what is your vision for the service going forward? I would like to see a Barbados Fire Service that can efficiently respond to any call for help with well-qualified officers, state to the art equipment, responding to any call for help in any part of the island, whether it be medical, fire, or rescue. That would be my vision for the fire service. We have well-qualified officers and be able to respond for any call in any of the disciplines. That means that they are well-trained in medical, they're well-qualified in the firefighting, and whatever the case may be, is rescue, that they can respond adequately to that. And I know Barbadians are looking forward to the construction of those new fire stations. Yes, I believe so. I am also looking forward to constructing the new fire station because there's a passion of serving the public and all fire officers love to serve the public. They just want to be closer to them, that the travel distance will not have to be so long. My final question to you, given the service that you are in, do you think that Barbadians truly appreciate the work done by the men and women of the Barbados Fire Service, given that you risk your lives on a daily basis to save others? I would say that they do appreciate. Sometimes I don't think that they know the extent of the things that we do. Um, when they're sometimes called for an incident, they're, and the fire service turns up, they wonder, I didn't know the fire service used to do that. I was at a scene already, and I was inside of the crowd. I stood in the crowd and let my officers do their thing. And I heard some persons in the crowd saying, now the fire service is here, we will now see some action. And that made me feel really, really proud to know that the public out there believe that once the fire service arrive on the scene, something will happen that is help there and that something positive will happen. That made me feel proud. And we will continue to do our training, our certification of our officers um, to make sure that they are second to none. And when I speak to certification, one of the things that we are looking at and strongly looking at is to ensure that we get third party certification as opposed to we doing it, we deconstructing the course, and we certifying our officers all in one, that when they are questioned, we can say without a shadow of a doubt, these officers were certified by this thing. So there's no bias. Well, Mr. Maynard, Barbados thanks you and your team at the Barbados Fire Service for all you're doing on a daily basis to keep us as safe as possible. And we thank you for highlighting the work that these brave men and women do from day to day. My pleasure. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
That was Mr. Errol Maynard, the Chief of Fire Officer of the Barbados Fire Service. I'm Lisa Lord. You are watching One on One. Do have yourself a wonderful evening.